thank you, Randall, uh, and thank you to everybody here at the Business Roundtable for having me here today. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words and then uh, hopefully spend a lot of time uh, taking your questions. Uh, seven years ago today it was one of the worst days in the history of our economy. Uh, if you picked up the Wall Street Journal that morning, you read that the shocks from AIG and Lehman were spreading worldwide. Uh, the day before, stocks had suffered their worst loss since 9-11. In the months after, businesses would go bankrupt, millions of Americans would lose their jobs and their homes, and our economy would reach the brink of collapse. Uh, that's where we were when I became uh, chief executive. Uh, here's where we are today. Businesses like yours have created more than 13 million new jobs over the past 66 months, uh, the longest streak of job growth on record. The unemployment rate is lower than it's been in over seven years. There are more job openings right now than at any time in our history. Housing has bounced back. Household wealth is higher than it was before the recession. We have made enormous strides in both traditional energy sources and clean energy sources while reducing our carbon emissions. And our education system uh, is actually making significant progress uh, with significant gains in uh, reducing the dropout rate, reading scores increasing, math scores increasing. Uh, and by the way, uh, more than 16 million people have health insurance that didn't have it before. So this progress is a testament to American business and innovation. It's a testament to the workers that you employ. Uh, but I'm going to take a little credit, too. Uh, it's a testament to some good policy decisions. Uh, soon after we took office, we passed the Recovery Act, rescued our auto industry, worked to rebuild our economy on a stronger foundation for growth. Uh, other countries, uh, in some cases, embraced uh, austerity as an ideology without looking at the data and the facts, tried to cut their way out of recession. Uh, the results speak for themselves. America has come back from crisis faster than almost every other advanced nation on Earth. And at a time of significant global volatility, we remain the world's safest, smartest investment. Of course, I will not be satisfied, uh, and we as a country shouldn't be satisfied until more working families are feeling uh, the recovery in their own lives. Uh, but the fact is that uh, what I've called middle class economics has been good for business. Corporate profits have hit an all time high. Slowing health care prices and plummeting energy costs have helped your bottom lines. Manufacturing is growing at the fastest clip in about two decades. Our workforce is more educated than ever before. The stock market has more than doubled since 2009, and 2015 is on pace to be uh, the year with the highest consumer confidence since 2004. And America's technological entrepreneurs uh, have continued to make incredible products that uh, are changing our lives rapidly. Now, you wouldn't know any of this if you were uh, listening to the folks who are seeking this office that I occupy. Uh, in the echo chamber uh, that is uh, presidential politics, everything is dark and everything is terrible. Uh, they don't seem to offer many solutions for the disasters that they perceive, but they're uh, quick to tell you who to blame. Uh, I'm here to say that there's nothing uh, particularly uh, patriotic or American about talking down America, especially when we stand as one of the few sources of economic strength in the world. Right now, we've got the chance to build on progress that we have made and that is acknowledged worldwide. We have a chance to grow the economy even faster, create jobs even faster, lift people's incomes and prospects even faster. We just have to make some sensible choices. Uh, and I'm going to focus on one particular example. Uh, America's next fiscal year is almost upon us, which means that Congress has about two weeks to pass a budget. If they don't, they will shut down America's government for the second time in two years. 
Democrats are ready to sit down and negotiate with Republicans right now, today, as we speak. Uh, but it should be over legitimate questions of spending and revenue, not unrelated ideological issues. Uh, you'll recall that two years ago Republicans shut down the government because they didn't like Obamacare. Uh, today, some are suggesting the government should be shut down because they don't like Planned Parenthood. Uh, that's not good sense, and it's not good business. Uh, the notion that we play chicken with a $18 trillion economy and uh, uh, global markets that are already skittish, all because of uh, an issue around a woman's health provider that receives less than 20 cents out of every $1,000 in the federal budget, uh, that's not good policy making. Now, the last time Republicans shut down the government, it cost our economy billions of dollars. Consumer confidence plummeted. Uh, I don't think anybody here thinks that's going to be good for your business. Uh, I've always believed what our first Republican president, uh, a guy from my home state named Abraham Lincoln, believed uh, that through government, we should do together those things that we can't do as well by ourselves. Funding infrastructure projects, educating the best workforce in the world, investing in cutting-edge research and development uh, so that businesses can take that research and take some risks uh, to create new products and new services, setting basic rules for the marketplace that encourage innovation and fair competition that help a market-based economy thrive, creating a safety net that uh, not only helps the most vulnerable on a, in our society, but also frees all of us to take risks and protect against life's uncertainties, and welcoming rather than disparaging the striving immigrants that have always been the source of continued renewal, economic vibrancy, uh, and dynamism in our economy. So. My hope is that Congress aims a little higher than just not shutting the government down. That's a good start. Uh, we'd like them to achieve that, but I think we can do better. Uh, we can actually do some things to help the economy grow. After the last shutdown, both parties came together and uh, unwound some of the irrational cuts to our economy and milita uh, military readiness that's known as sequester. Uh, that agreement expires in two weeks as well. And for those of you who are not steeped in federal budget terminology, uh, sequester basically are automatic top-line cuts that don't discriminate, don't think through what are good investments and what is waste. And if we don't reverse the cuts that are currently in place, a lot of the drivers of growth that your companies depend on, research, job training, infrastructure, uh, education for our workforce, uh, they are going to be reduced effectively at a time when other countries around the world are racing uh, to get ahead of us. Uh, on the other hand, if Congress does reverse some of these cuts, then our own budget office estimates it would add about half a million, uh, half a million jobs to our economy next year alone, uh, about 0.4 percent to GDP. And keep in mind that we can afford it right now. You know, all the things I said at the front in terms of the recovery that we've made, uh, we've also reduced the deficit by two-thirds. Right now it's about 2.8 percent of GDP. We've reduced our deficit faster than some of those countries that pursued strict austerity policies and weren't thinking about how to grow the economy. Uh, and so we are well positioned without adding to the deficit. Uh, since the de uh, I want to repeat, since I took office, we've cut the deficit by more than two-thirds. And the good news is we might actually be moving uh, beyond some of the stale debates we've been having about spending and revenue over the past several years if what uh, economists uh, and you know, people who are knowledgeable about the federal budget are listened to as opposed to this being driven by uh, short-term politics. People in both parties, including some of the leading Republican candidates for president, uh, have been putting out proposals, some I agree with, some I don't. I'll give you one example, though. Uh, you've got two leading candidates on the Republican side who have said that we should eliminate the carried interest loophole. 
Now, there's disagreement in this room around that. But I will tell you that keeping this tax loophole, uh, which leads to uh, folks who are doing very well paying lower rates than their secretaries, uh, is not in any demonstrable way improving our economy. On the other hand, if we close the tax loophole, we could double the number of workers in America's job training programs. We could help another 4 million students afford college. Now, these are sensible choices that if you were running your business and you took a look at it, you'd make that decision. Well, America should too. And this is an example of how we can maintain fiscal responsibility while at the same time making the investments that we need to grow. So the bottom line is this. Seven years ago, uh, if we had listened to some politicians who said we could only cut our way to prosperity, uh, the fact is we'd be worse off today. If we listen to them now, then we're going to be worse off tomorrow. Uh, I hope that you will talk to your friends in Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, as Congress flirts with another shutdown, remind them of what is at stake. Uh, we will have some disagreements sometimes. Uh, I do not expect to get 100 percent of what I want in any conversation, including with my wife. Um, but I do expect us to stay focused on uh, why we're here, which is to help the American people and businesses like yours and your workers uh, do better. That's our job. We're not supposed to be impeding progress. We're supposed to be advancing progress, accelerating it. Uh, and if our leaders can put common uh, sense over ideology uh, and the good of the country before the good of the party, then uh, we'll do just fine. Um, despite the perennial doom and gloom that I guess is uh, inevitably part of a presidential campaign, America's winning right now. America's great right now. We can do even better. But the reason that I'm so confident about our future is not because of our government or the uh, size of our GDP or our military, but because everybody in this country that I meet around the, uh, regardless of uh, their station in life, their race, their religion, uh, the region they live in, uh, they do believe in a common creed uh, that if people work hard in this country, uh, they should be able to get ahead. And uh, I know that's what you believe. Uh, that's the values that uh, you try to instill in your companies as well. Uh, my hope is, is that uh, that decency, uh, that hard work, uh, that common sense is going to be reflected here in Washington. So with that, let me take some questions. And uh, I'm going to start with Randall, because uh, since he volunteered for what I'm sure is a thankless job of being head of the <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it going here. I, I know there are a lot of other questions for you, but uh, Leader McConnell was just here a little earlier, and he gave us all a cause to exhale talking about the budget and mm -hmm. seemed confident that we would get to a place where we would have a budget. And in the context of that, he spoke about how split government can actually provide opportunities for getting big things done that might be hard to get done otherwise. And he caused a head snapper with all of us when he gave you a very strong compliment over uh, I'm, your- My head snapping. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Uh, trade promotion authority yeah. and uh, how you worked that. And you worked it very aggressively. And by the way, all of us in here, Mike Froman, I don't know if he's here, and, and Jeff Zients are very complimentary of the work that was done there. So now we've, you have the authority to get a trade deal done. It's going to have to come back to Congress and so forth. Talk to us a little bit about uh, your view of the opportunity to get the, uh, the tra Trans-Pacific deal done. Uh, I I am confident that we can get it done, uh, and I believe we can get it done this year. Uh, the uh, trade ministers should be meeting again sometime in the next several weeks. They have the opportunity to close the deal. Uh, most chapters have been completed at this point, and I'm confident that uh, it will, in fact, accomplish our central goal which is to make sure that we've got a level playing field for American businesses and American workers in the fastest growing region of the world. Um, there are going to be unprecedented protections for 
labor standards and environmental standards, but also for IP protection, also for making sure that uh, when you know, any company here makes an investment, that they're, they're not being disadvantaged, uh, but are instead being treated like uh, domestic companies uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, and so the notion here is, is that we've got uh, 11 nations who represent the fastest growing, most populous part of the world, buying into a high standards trade deal that allows us and your companies on a consistent basis to compete. And uh, the good news is, is that uh, with a lot of tough negotiating and a lot of uh, pushing and pulling, mainly by Mr. Froman, but occasionally I get called in uh, to, to lob a call uh, into uh, one of my counterparts, uh, I, I think that we'll, we'll, we're going to get this done. Now, the key then, once we close the negotiations and we have an agreement, is to get TPP through Congress. Uh, it, we got it through. Uh, I will return the compliment. Uh, Mitch McConnell worked very hard and very creatively to get it done. Uh, we should not assume, though, that because the authority was done that we automatically are going to be able to get TPP done. And uh, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the reason is that uh, the politics around trade are tough. And I said this even in the run-up to uh, getting TPA uh, authority. A lot of Americans, when they think of trade, think of plants in their hometown or nearby shutting down and moving to Mexico or China. And American manufacturing and good paying jobs being lost. That's the image of trade. And uh, the argument that I have made consistently to Democrats has been that there may have been some uh, mistakes made in past trade agreements in not, for example, having enforceable labor and environmental provisions that put American companies that are doing the right thing at a disadvantage. Uh, that there weren't enough safeguards for intellectual property and uh, you know, the abuses of state-owned enterprises and subsidies that uh, companies may have been involved with. But that's the status quo now. And if you want to correct those things, we've got to raise the bar. Uh, I didn't fully persuade all my Democratic colleagues because the politics are tough. Uh, and, and I was willing. Uh, to uh, take my case uh, to the Democratic caucus and, and to talk to my friends and organized labor and say that uh, we can't look backwards, we've got to look forward. We, we're going to have to compete in these areas. Here, here's the concern politically is that uh, I think within the Republican Party, some of the same impulses that are anti-immigration reform, some of the same impulses that uh, see the entire world as a threat and we've got to wall ourselves off, uh, some of those same impulses also start creeping into uh, the trade debate. And uh, a, a party that traditionally was pro-free trade now has a substantial element uh, that uh, may feel differently. And so the BRT, I think, you know, you've got to put Angler to work over there. Uh, you know, to their credit, both uh, both uh, Mitch McConnell and, and John Boehner, uh, I think, are on on uh, on the right program here. Uh, but they're going to need some help potentially with uh, their membership, because the closer we get to political season, uh, the tighter some of these votes get. I I will tell you this though, I I am confident that if if I'm presenting an agreement to Congress, that it will meet the commitment that I made that this would be the highest standard, most progressive trade deal in American history. It'll be good for American business and American workers. All right.
Hi, Mr. President. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I wanted to ask you about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. You know, you put an executive order in place earlier this year uh, because of the issues we have with information sharing and with liabilities. And we at the BRT are very supportive of the legislation that has passed the House and is now in progress in the Senate. And I wanted to just get your thoughts on how you're thinking about this and also with the upcoming visit of the President of China about cybersecurity and our relationship with China. Uh, this is an issue that is not going away. It is going to be more and more important and uh, it is going to be very challenging. Uh, it, it's challenging in part because uh, the Internet itself, the architecture of it, uh, was not intended to carry trillions of dollars of transactions and everybody's personal information. It was designed for a couple of professors to trade <laughs> uh, you know, academic papers. And, and so uh, the, the kind of security that we are looking for was not embedded into the DNA of the Internet. And the vulnerabilities are significant, and they are ex being exploited by uh, not just uh, state actors, but also non-state actors and criminal gangs at uh, an accelerating pace. So this is something that from a national security perspective and from a business perspective, we're going to have to continue to, to concentrate on. One of the big issues that you mentioned, Maggie, that we're uh, focused on is this encryption issue. And there is a legitimate uh, tension around this issue. On the one hand, the stronger the encryption, the better we can potentially protect our data. And so there's an argument that says we want to turbocharge our encryption uh, so that nobody can crack it. On the other hand, if you have uh, encryption that doesn't have any way to get in there, we are now empowering ISIL, child pornographers, others uh, to essentially be able to operate within a black box uh, in ways that we've never experienced before uh, during the, the telecommunications age. And I'm not talking, by the way, about some of the controversies around NSA. I'm talking about the traditional FBI going to a judge, getting a, you know, a, a warrant, uh, showing probable cause, but still can't get in. So we've created a process around which to, to see if we can square the circle here and reconcile the need for greater and greater encryption and the legitimate needs of national security and law enforcement. And uh, I, I won't say that we've cracked the code yet, but we've got some of the smartest folks, not just in government, but also in the private sector, uh, working together uh, tr to try to resolve it. Um, and what's interesting is even in the private sector, even in the tech community, people are on different sides of this thing. Uh, with respect to China, this will probably be one of the biggest topics that I discuss with President Xi. Um, we have repeatedly said to the Chinese government that we understand traditional intelligence gathering functions that all states, including us, engage in. And we will do everything we can to stop you from getting state secrets or transcripts of a meeting that I've had, but we understand you're going to be trying to do that. That is fundamentally different from uh, your government or its proxies engaging directly in industrial espionage and stealing trade secrets, stealing proprietary information from companies. Uh, that we consider an act of aggression that has to stop. And uh, you know, we are preparing a number of measures that will indicate to the Chinese that this is not just a matter of us 
being mildly upset, but uh, is something that will put significant strains on the bilateral relationship if not resolved, and that uh, we are prepared to take some countervailing uh, actions um, in order to get their attention. My hope is, is that it gets uh, results short of that. And ultimately, the goal should be to have some basic international framework that won't be perfect, because there's still going to be a lot of non-state actors that uh, and hackers who are very good. And we're still going to have to you know, have good defense and still have to be able to find the fingerprints of those and, and, and apprehend them or, and, and stop networks that are engaged in, uh, in cybercrime. But among states, there has to be a, a framework that is uh, analogous to what we've done with uh, nuclear power because uh, nobody stands to gain, and, and frankly, um, uh, although the Chinese and Russians are close, we're still the best at this. And if we wanted to go on offense, uh, a whole bunch of countries would have some significant problems. And, and, and it, it, we don't want to see the, the Internet weaponized in that way. Uh, that requires, I think, some tough negotiations. That, that won't be a one-year process, but we'd like to see if we can. If, if we and the Chinese are able to, to coalesce around a process for negotiations, then I think we can bring uh, a lot of other countries along. Okay. And, we will, and we will work with you on that, too. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Ursula? Thank you for being here. Um, it's also good to be reminded occasionally of some of the progress that we've made in, like, a complete sentence. So I think thank you for that yeah. um, as well. And, you know, some recent wins. TPA is good. Even the Iran deal, really good. Healthcare standing up, all good. The place that we haven't made a lot of progress, but that's really important for business and business progress is on tax and tax reform. Mm -hmm. And what we're getting to now is, a, I think, almost kind of like being backed in a corner. So since you can't get a grand deal, yeah. we're starting to talk about sub-deals. Mm -hmm. And the sub-deals in and of themselves are destructive, in the Business Roundtable's view, to the grand deal, which is total tax reform or comprehensive right. tax reform. So can you help us think about how we should negotiate um, this this um, duality uh, that we're in right now, and, yeah. and you know, where do you think we're going to end up? We put forward a proposal early on that uh, I, I'm confident I could sell to this group. Uh, not everybody would be thrilled, but uh, I think I could argue that over time would be good for business, because essentially what we proposed was. The, the, the traditional framework for tax reform, close loopholes, lower rates. We'd address international taxation in ways that currently put American businesses at a disadvantage and would allow for repatriation, but would not simply uh, empty out the Treasury uh, and would generate enough revenue that we could actually also pay for some infrastructure. And our hope was that we'd get some nibbles on the other side. Uh, to his credit, Paul Ryan uh, expressed real interest in discussions and negotiations. Uh, but uh, the, your previous speaker, uh, Mitch McConnell, has said that he is not interested in getting tax reform comprehensive tax reform of that sort done. Um, so uh, there's still work being done. We're still in conversations with Mr. Ryan, uh, and uh, I know that uh, Senator Schumer and others have still been working on the possibilities of uh, a, a, a fairly robust uh, package. Um, but ultimately, you're going to have to have the leader of uh, the Senate majority party uh, bought in to uh, try to get this done. Um, you know, ta I understand why tax reform is elusive, because uh, e e those of us who believe in a simpler, fairer, more competitive tax framework in the abstract sometimes look at our bottom lines and say, oh, no, that deduction's helping us pretty good here. 
And uh, even if this organization has been supportive, there are other business organizations in town that have some pretty uh, strong uh, uh, influence over uh, the Republican Party uh, that haven't been as wild on it, partly because their view is, is that uh, the only kind of tax reform that's acceptable is one that would also lower all rates, regardless of its effect on the deficit. That's just not something that uh, is, is viable. So uh, we're going to keep on working on it. Uh, my suggestion would be that uh, the BRT continue to encourage uh, uh, Speaker Boehner, Paul Ryan, uh, Mitch McConnell to, to come up with uh, an ambitious package. And what I can assure you is, is that the White House will take it seriously. Uh, we don't expect that everything in our original package would go forward. Uh, but what the, the one thing that we couldn't do, and, and you know, I, I get concerned sometimes uh, that what is labeled as tax reform ends up just being cuts. You're not closing the loopholes. And as a consequence, it's a huge drain on the Treasury. We then suddenly are accused of running up the deficit to help uh, your tax rates, and we're not doing enough to help uh, grow the economy and, and help ordinary uh, workers. So, so that's uh, the, the one direction we can't go in. Right. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on energy policy, but I know we talk a lot about all the above, but I think what's really changing kind of in an in unprecedented way here recently are technology revolutions that are occurring either in the production of energy mm -hmm. or perhaps more importantly in the use of energy yeah. um, that gives Americans, I think, a way to play offense in what has been a set of unprecedented challenges. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, but, Tom, I think you described it well. I, I am much more optimistic about uh, our ability to get a handle around energy that is good for our economy, good for business, good for consumers, good for job creation, and maybe saves the planet in the process. Uh, I'm much more optimistic about that now than I was when I started as president. And, and, and a good example is just uh, when you look at what's happened with solar. Um, I mean, we're not quite at Moore's law yet, but the pace at which uh, the, the unit costs for uh, solar energy have gone down is stunning. Uh, we've seen not quite the same pace, but similar progress around wind. Our natural gas production is unprecedented, and I have been very supportive of uh, our natural gas production as being not only important to our economy, but also geopolitically. Uh, it, it's a huge recipe for energy independence. As long as we get it, the methane uh, discharge issues right, and uh, I think there are ways of doing that with sound science. Um, so that's on the production side, and as you said, on the utilization side, all of you are, th there, there's not a company here that is not producing significantly more product with less energy than you were just 10 years ago and certainly than you were 20 years ago. Everybody here has, has seen the, the power of tracking, utilization, identifying waste, and uh, timing issues around uh, you know, when is energy expensive, when is energy cheap. Uh, so, so there's enormous progress on the commercial side and then uh, individual households now with things like Nest or the equivalents, uh, you know, we're, we're able to fine tune our energy usage in ways that we just haven't seen before. And then you've got the whole transportation sector in which we've continued to make significant progress uh, in Detroit as well as you know, uh, upstarts like Tesla. 
Um, there's still some distribution network issues uh, around uh, the, the, the transportation revolution, although companies like UPS are doing a great job, uh, I think, already experimenting with their fleets. Uh, so, so that's all good news. Um, I, I, I would say that the, the, the big challenge now, if, if we're going to realize all the potential here, is uh, to work with utilities so that they have a business model in which they're making money while seeing this change in distribution patterns and grid because I think that there's still some legitimate economic issues there that have to be sorted through. Uh, and, and it's tricky because it's a patchwork system. We don't have one national grid, obviously. The second thing is investment in basic research needs to continue. Um, I mean, uh, battery technology is greatly improved, but we still haven't seen all the breakthroughs that I think that we can make with battery technology that would make a huge difference in storage. Uh, and, and that's uh, an, an exciting uh, area for, uh, for development. Uh, and, and then I, I would urge the BRT, and some of you individually as companies have already done this, uh, view the issue of climate change and the Paris Conference is going to be coming up at the end of this year as an opportunity uh, rather than as uh, a problem. Because this is coming. Uh, it's coming generationally. If you talk to your kids or my kids, they are much more attuned to this issue. Uh, consumers c are going to be caring about it more and more. The, the environmental effects that we're seeing, uh, I, I'm going to be calling Jerry Brown later today just to talk about California wildfires. Some of you may have read the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas lowest it's been in 500 years. Uh, uh, the flooding problems that we're already seeing in places like South Florida, it, it, you know, it's just during high tide. Suddenly, billions of dollars of the property is underwater. So this is coming. And for us to be out ahead of it and to think about how our ingenuity and our science can solve these problems is going to give us a jump on everybody else. So uh, there is a, a, a pledge that the BR, uh, some members of the BRT have organized around supporting a strong Paris Agreement. I would encourage you to sign up on that and look for opportunities on this. Uh, and, and that includes you know, uh, companies that have been in traditional fossil fuel uh, areas because, you know, you, you know, if you know how to do oil and gas well, you can figure out how to do solar well. You can figure out how to make money doing it. You can figure out how to uh, 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 create uh, efficiencies that uh, uh, help your bottom line. Uh, and, and, and what we've tried to do with the Clean Power pl uh, Plan is to give states flexibility, understanding everybody's got a different energy mix. So, you know, down south, we approved the first nuclear plant uh, in a generation, basically, because we think nuclear needs to be part of that package. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that uh, there are going to be different ways to skin the cat on this thing. Um, we just have to set a baseline in which all of us understand the direction we need to go. Uh, instead of us spending a lot of time fighting science, uh, let, let's go with science. We, we usually do better when we're on the side of facts and evidence and science. Uh, just as a general rule, that's, that's uh, proved to be our strength as Americans. Yeah. Jim. Uh, if I could just turn back to China for a second. Uh, the, you know, there are a lot of issues we've got to sort out. And uh, you mentioned a couple of them, cybersecurity, uh, their feelings about TPP, uh, their own economy. Uh, their, uh, their inward turn in the name of creating a consumer economy has had some protectionist elements that we don't like. I think, though, I think many in this room would uh, like to see some kind of positive outcome from this summit as well that uh, underlines our mutual benefit if we can figure out 
some of these things and uh, find a way for the world's two biggest economies to see a path forward as well as all the issues we've got. And I, do you have a comment on the tone you're going to try to set with the President and, uh, and uh, roles that we could play in supporting both the uh, managing our relationship as well as finding a future for it? My tone with respect to China has been pretty consistent. Uh, it, it, it doesn't jump up and down depending on where the polls are. Uh, my view is that uh, China should be and will continue to be an economic competitor. Uh, that we need to make sure that uh, you know we are uh, reaching an understanding with them about our presence as a Pacific power. But that it is in our interest for China to continue what has been dubbed uh, a peaceful, orderly rise. I think that's good for the world. China's a big place with a lot of people, and we're better off if those people are eaten and have shelter and are buying consumer goods rather than starving and uh, riding on the streets. Uh, and so what I've consistently communicated first to President Hu when I came into office, now President Xi, is uh, our goal is to have them as a partner in helping to maintain a set of international rules and norms that benefit everybody. That in fact were what facilitated China's rise. I mean, you know, they were essentially uh, riding on our backs for the last 30 years because we were underwriting peace, security, uh, you know, the free flow of commerce, uh, international uh, rules in the financial sector. And you know, as they have matured, what we've said to them is, with power comes responsibility. So now you've got to step up. You can't act as if you are uh, a third world country and pursue protectionist policies or uh, engage in dumping or not protect uh, intellectual property at a time when we're now, uh, when you're now the second and eventually probably the first largest economy in the world. Um, you, you can't simply pursue an export-driven strategy because you're too big. <laughs> you're not going to be able to grow your economy at the same pace over the next 20 years that you did in the last 20 years. Once your economy reaches a certain size, there's not enough global market to absorb that, uh, which means that you've got to start thinking about transparency within your own economy and uh, how are uh, you setting up a, a safety net so that workers have some cushion and in turn are willing to spend money as opposed to stuffing it in the mattress. You've got to be concerned about environmental uh, issues because you can't breathe in Beijing and that spills over uh, for all of us. And, you, and as a large country w w with a powerful military, you can't go around pushing your little neighbors around just because you're bigger. But you have to start abiding by a, a basic code of conduct and a, and a set of rules uh, because ultimately you will be advantaged by everybody following the rules. And uh, I think in some areas the Chinese understand this. I think in other areas they don't. I think in other areas they still see themselves as uh, the poor country that shouldn't have any obligations internationally. Um, and in some cases, they still feel that when we call them on issues like their behavior in the South China Sea or on uh, intellectual property theft, uh, that we are trying to contain them, as opposed to 
us just wanting them to abide by uh, the same rules that helped create an environment in which they can rise. So, uh, but I, but the, the, the good news is that our, our fates are sufficiently intertwined that, and I in many ways they still need us a lot more than we need them, Th that uh, I think that there are going to be continuing areas in which they move. Uh, as long as we don't resort to the kind of loose talk and name calling that I notice uh, some of our presidential candidates engage in. People you know. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it tends not to be constructive. The, the one, the, the, uh, so uh, bottom line though is, Jim, I think that this summit will be useful. I think there are going to be a lot of outcomes uh, around things like energy and climate change, around uh, 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 improvements in uh, how they deal with investors uh, uh, that will show uh, constructive progress. I think our military to military conversations have been much better uh, than they were uh, when I began office. The, the one thing I would suggest that the BRT can do, two things. Uh, number one, and I, I think I've said this to you, uh, some of you in the past, when your companies have a problem in China uh, and you want us to help, you have to let us help. Don't tell us on the side, we got this problem, you need to look into it, but then, uh, but don't, but our, leave our names out of it because we want to be punished kind of thing. I, th typically, we are not effective with the Chinese unless we are able to present facts and evidence of a problem. Otherwise, they'll just stonewall and slow walk uh, issues. So if, if we're seeing problems in terms of the competitive environment there, in terms of protecting your IP, in terms of uh, you know, un unfair competition uh, that, that runs afoul of understanding the principles that have already been established, you, you've got to let us know and, and, and let us be your advocates. Uh, I, that's important. The second thing I think everybody here should do is, uh, is not fall into the same trap that we fell into uh, around Japan in the 1980s, which is somehow, you know, China's taken over, just like Japan was taken over, and we're in inevitable decline. This whole argument, I, I, I'm just going to go on a quick rant here for a second. This whole notion that somehow, uh, you know, we're getting out, competed out, dealt out, this out, that, we're losing, you know, we, we're, we're, we're in terror. Nobody outside the United States understands what we're talking about. I mean, we've got problems. We've got issues. Our biggest problem is gridlock in Washington and us just not making some sensible policies. But overall, our cards are so much better than everybody else's. Uh, our pool of quality businesses and talent and the, uh, our institutions and our rule of law and how we manage uh, and adapt to new and changing circumstances and our dominance in uh, knowledge-based uh, industries, nobody matches us. And we attract th the best talent around the world still wants to come here if we just let them come. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's important for business voices to to point out every once in a while, America's in the driver's seat if we make some smart decisions. And, you know, that, that's, not a, that's not a partisan comment. That is just the fact. There's not a country out there right now, including China, that wouldn't look at us with, with envy right now. And, and, and so our, our, our problem's not that China's going to out-negotiate us and or, or that Mr. Putin is sort of out strategizing. I said, anybody taking a look at the Russian economy lately? <laughs> That's not our problem. Our problem is us, typically. 
Yeah, we're the uh, we we engage in. Uh, you know, and I'm being generous when I say we, um, but but. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we I engage in self-inflicted wounds like this potential government shutdown. It's unnecessary. All right, got time for a couple more questions. Good to see. You. How you doing? How you doing? Ed? I'm. Do How's everybody back home? This summer, the expiration of the XM Bank uh, authorization. Speaking of self-inflicted wounds. Uh, un understand. And part of the ongoing discussion debate here in Washington, the Senate has attached a reauthorization, as you yeah. know, to the transportation bill, which right. is now uh, down at the House. Right. And we, uh, on Monday, the roundtable sent a uh, letter to the leadership uh, on both sides uh, in Congress pointing out really the benefits of reauthorization, that some of those get lost in this debate because really it's been characterized as only benefiting a few companies, which ignores the thousands of people who are basically employed by our suppliers across the country and the impact, positive impact that has, as well as it's a net generator revenue for the governor, for the uh, government. And you know, we have plans to have further discussions later today and this week uh, with leadership in the House. Do you have any, we had a good discussion with your team this morning, do you have any insights that uh, you could share with us that would help us in getting that reauthorization? It is mind-boggling that uh, this wasn't reauthorized a year ago. Uh, and it is this weird reversal mm -hmm. in which uh, the principal opponents are uh, the Tea Party Caucus and, and the Republican Party. Uh, somehow XM Bank has become uh, this cause celebre uh, of what is, what are some of uh, the presidential candidates call it crony capitalism and and what's ironic is obvious I think some of you know the backstory there was I think a member of this organization that kind of started this whole thing because they were upset about s some planes being sold to <laughs> uh, a competitor on a route and uh, suddenly this caught fire in uh, in the right wing uh, internet and it, it's just hard to explain. Look, Ed, I, I had a group of small businesses ranging from, what, four people to a couple of hundred people talking about how they use XM. This is the only way that they can get into these markets. And as you said, XM doesn't cost the government. It, this is not a... Uh, a money loser for us. Uh, and, you know, I don't have to tell Emil or, or, or Jim how's, how important it is. I, I keep on telling them I, I expect a gold watch from, uh, from them because it seems like every time I take a foreign trip, I got to sell some turbine or a plane. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and you know, I, I was uh, concerned about Jeff's announcement uh, that. Jobs that were here in the United States are now going to be going overseas because we don't, we don't get this done. But but that's true for the suppo supply chain. It's also true for some some smaller companies that use XM directly. It's not just that they're part of the the GE or Boeing supply chain. It's that you know they're selling tea to a country, and this is the only mechanism they have to to be able to make those sales. Uh, the good news is McConnell and Boehner both say they want to get it done. Uh, as you said, there were, we've already shown there are sufficient votes for it in the Senate, and we actually think there are sufficient votes for it in the House. I would concentrate uh, your attention on House Republican caucus members, uh, and I think you have to flood the zone and let them know this is important. Uh, and, and that includes, by the way, uh, talking to individual members who in their districts potentially have companies that are being adversely affected 
as long as XM is frozen. Uh, but my expectation is it gets done, uh, you know, during the course of these uh, these budget negotiations, uh, and and I, we're going to push as hard as we can to get it done. Okay. Yeah. The, one of the issues that we deal with, and we talked about last time you were here, was regulations, mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the areas that the business roundtable is very focused on these days is the ozone rule, which October 1, your administration will be coming out with a recommendation associated with that. The business roundtable position is that we need to maintain the 75 parts per billion uh, to lower that standard when technology doesn't exist and when communities are already advancing toward the 75 goal. Um, if you lower it to 70, it's going to introduce another 200 uh, counties in this country into non-attainment, which basically is a, you know, we're not open for business, and that's our concern. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or what the administration's plans are in that regard? There, there's a lot of complicated technical issues involved in this, but uh, I'll, I'll try to s simplify it as much as possible. Number one, we're under a court order <laughs> to do this. So, uh, I think there may be a misperception that the EPA uh, can do whatever it wants here. Uh, there were lawsuits brought under the previous administration that continued into my administration. We went before a judge. We actually, I think properly, got some additional time because there was the notion that we were going to lower standards uh, a few years ago, and then immediately get new data and force everybody to lower them all over again. And we said, you know, let's just do this one time in a sensible way so that people can plan. Uh, but uh, we've got some legal constraints. This is not something that just popped out of my head uh, uh, full blown. Uh, and so I always enjoy seeing the, uh, you know, the advertising for Obama's ozone plan. Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> The, the ozone rules date back to, you know, when I was, uh, I think, still in law school, uh, before I had any gray hair. And, uh, you know, there are some fairly stringent uh, statutory guidelines by which uh, the EPA is supposed to evaluate uh, uh, the, uh, the standards. So uh, the EPA is following the science and the statutes as best as it can. We are mindful that in some cases, because of the nature of uh, where pollutants are generated, where they blow, that this can create a really complicated situation for certain local jurisdictions and, and, and local communities, and, and, and some states uh, and counties end up being hit worse than others. And we're trying to work with uh, you know, those, uh, those states and those communities uh, as best we can, taking in their concerns into account. Um, so, so I guess the bottom line uh, is th this is y you can legitimately go after me on the on the uh, on the clean power plant rule because we that w that was hatched by us, and I believe that we need to deal with climate change, and so we can have a lengthy debate about that. And uh, here uh, on on. Uh, uh, on, on ozone, you know, this is a existing statute and an existing mechanism, and we are uh, charged with uh, uh, implementing it based on the science that's presented to us. And that's what we're trying to do, but we're taking this input uh, into account. Uh, I recognize some of the concerns. Um, I, I will say this, last point I'll make on this, uh, even with the costs associated with um, uh, with, it, with implementing the ozone rule. When you do a cost benefit, the amount of lives saved, asthma averted, and so forth, is still substantially higher than the cost. Now that doesn't necessarily resolve all the concerns that people may have about local costs being borne, whereas uh, the savings are spread out uh, more broadly. 
and and you know, th uh, th those are legitimate economic issues that have to be uh, considered. And I, the EPA uh, has been uh, has been listening to I think uh, every the s stakeholder there. But I think what you'll see in the analysis overall is we we don't issue a regulation where the costs uh, are not lower than the benefits. And if you look at the regulations we've generally put forward the costs are substantially lower than the benefits that are generated. Okay. Okay. Doug? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Fager. Um, many of us are interested in Cuba. Yeah. And the opening there has been positive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of issues to get to full right. uh, normal relations. Just how do you see that path happening and, and the, what's the future of that in your opinion? Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a overnight transformation, uh, but I am convinced that by re-engaging Cuba, re-engaging the Cuban people, uh, that we are creating the environment in which a generational change and transition will take place in that country. And uh, already, you know, you're seeing conversations taking place about, you know, does it you know, how is Cuba going to uh, accommodate an influx of tourists? And, you know, uh, how do they think about the Internet and, uh, you know, open communications uh, in order to be able to participate in the modern economy? And that inevitably then leads to questions about can you hire, can a company hire a Cuban directly? Uh, foreign investor as opposed to going through the government. And, and over time that creates space for personal freedom and uh, I think uh, a long-term political transition. Uh, for now, what, uh, what we've said is that uh, we will step by step look for areas and opportunities within our authorities as long as Congress still has the embargo in place, there are certain things we can't do, but there are certain things we can do, for example, on telecommunications, and we're looking for opportunities there. Uh, and we will also continue to press the Cuban government around issues of uh, political uh, freedom. And, and uh, when His Holiness the Pope comes, he's going to be visiting Cuba. Uh, that, I think, is going to be an opportunity for more uh, uh, you know, more interesting conversations inside of Cuba. Um, uh, my biggest suggestion would be for the BRT just to start having a conversation on a bipartisan basis about lifting the embargo. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily happen to have to happen or even should happen all in one fell swoop, but I think uh, if you look at the economic opportunities that are presented, uh, they're significant, uh, and it doesn't make much sense that a country 90 miles <coughs> off the shore of Florida that is not at this point a significant threat uh, to us uh, and that has shown itself willing to, to at least look beyond its borders for the first time, um, even if it's still scared of what it might bring. Uh, it doesn't make sense for us to uh, keep sticking to the old ways of doing business. I'll actually take uh, one more question, I, and then and then I'll come around and say hi to everybody. So, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, again, thank you. And yeah. I know a topic near to your heart has been education, yes. and for young folks. And you've spent a lot of time on this, and uh, and many of us have done things private partner, private public partnerships. Yeah. And you recently made a comment about uh, computer science for all high school uh, kids, which I think is an important point, because technology is such a yeah. broad topic, right. it will infiltrate all jobs Everything. in the future. So maybe a chance to make some comments about uh, how you envision something like that actually taking root over the long term, that we could make some progress with it. Well, uh, uh, first, scale, of, for, yeah. first of all, I want to uh, commend uh, Jenny and, and IBM, because you guys have done some terrific work. Uh, anybody who wants some inspiration, uh, go to the, uh, uh, the high school uh, that uh, IBM's uh, participating in, in Brooklyn where uh, kids, uh, a collaboration between 
the public school system, the city colleges of New York, uh, the CUNY system, and uh, IBM, and, and you've got kids from, you know, most of them, parents never went to college, a lot of them immigrant kids, uh, and they are marching through, you know, STEM education, uh, pre-engineering education, they're getting essentially college credits by the time they're sophomores or juniors uh, in, in high school. Uh, they're able to save money because in five years in high school they come out with an associate's degree. They then either are transferring to a four-year university with those credits or they're starting to work with IBM because they've been uh, apprenticing and, and, and uh, uh, the curriculum design uh, has, has given them confidence that if they do well, they're going to be able to get a job. Uh, you know, that, that model is something that we're actually looking to try to duplicate all across the country. And uh, the good news, as I mentioned at the top, is because of the strong work that Arne Duncan's done, uh, this, the strong work uh, that a lot of governors and local communities have done to, to increase accountability, creativity, have high expectations for kids, um, bust through some of the old bureaucratic uh, uh, obstacles. Uh, we've s we are seeing highest reading scores, highest math scores, highest graduation rates. And, uh, and part of our goal here is to uh, improve STEM education generally. A critical element of that is uh, understanding this computer age that these kids are immersed in. <coughs> and I don't want them just to know how to use their phone to play video games. I want them to know how that phone works and potentially code it and program it. And what's remarkable, I, I was, I'm, I'm about the age where I think my high school just had like the first coding class when I was maybe in seventh or eighth grade. But this is what you had like those cards, and it was, you know, and the punching cards. And uh, uh, now, you know, the, the, the way these, the, the, the tools and resources that are available uh, for kids, you know, starting in first, second grade, we have these science fairs, and, and these little Girl Scout troops come in, and they've coded, they've designed their own games, and uh, or simulations of uh, entire towns with people and you know, all, all kinds of scenarios that they've, they've figured out. And, and, and so uh, it, it's actually something that they naturally gravitate to. We just have to start early. It's almost like a foreign language where rather than try to catch kids when they're in 10th, 11th, 12th grade, make it part of the the broader curriculum and incorporate it into how you're teaching math and how you're teaching science and how you're teaching social studies. That seems to be the, the way in which kids get most uh, engaged. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of work uh, with many of you individually uh, as companies on this STEM education issue. Uh, uh, we hope uh, that uh, you will uh, continue to participate. You've, you've been great partners on that front. Um, I'll just say in closing, uh, uh, it, it, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I want to just reiterate as we enter into the silly season of politics uh, that uh, the, the primary thing that is holding back a lot of potential growth, jobs, uh, improved bottom lines, greater stability uh, is well within our control right now it, and are things that traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support. Ex-Im Bank, getting TPP done, financing and executing on an infrastructure policy. I've had conversations with folks like Larry Fink and others about if, if you know, we're open to looking at new creative ways of financing it, but the, f the notion that we're not doing that right now uh, makes absolutely no sense. Um, investing in research and development. These are not partisan issues. There are, there are some areas where there have traditionally been legitimate 
arguments between Democrats and Republicans. There are some issues, like on uh, environmental regulations or financial regulations, where you know, Jamie and I may disagree or, or Nick and I may disagree. And, and we can have those arguments, and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we probably won't uh, uh, convince each other uh, on some of these things. But what I'm looking at is the low-hanging fruit that are no-brainers and that nobody here would argue with. And the notion that we're not doing them right now, uh, because prim primarily because a faction within one of our parties has gone off the rails and sees a conspiracy around everything, or simply is opposed to anything I propose, even if they used to propose it, that's a problem. And, 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 uh, and, and I, th I, I think it's very important for all of you to just step back and, and take a look at it because you still have influence uh, uh, on at least some of those folks and, and, and challenge them. Why wouldn't we do things that everybody knows make sense? Thank you, everybody.